Amen. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through verse number 26. Have it on the screen behind me. The King James text today reads, Now we know, Paul is writing, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him, which believeth in Jesus. Hallelujah. This is probably one of the least understood in truth, truths, of the Christian faith today, grace. Grace today is the great compensation, and that is the title of my message, the great compensation. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment today, King Jesus, lover of lost men's souls, Savior of all who would believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for going to Calvary. We thank you, Lord, for providing for us what we could not possibly provide for ourselves, a means whereby we might stand holy, righteous, justified in your sight. Master, the Word of God is so precious it is today a treasure which you have placed in the hands of earthly men. Lord, today how in the name of God can we possibly do your precious sanctified word any justice? How can we? How can we mere mortals deliver the divine word of God in such a fashion? that it might bring hope, salvation, healing, deliverance to those who would hear and believe how. Oh God, I know the answer. The answer is the anointing, the presence, the power of the Holy Ghost. And this preacher today, Lord, relies so heavily upon that anointing. I acknowledge today, God, how important the anointing is preaching from the Word of God is worthless. But by reason of the Holy Ghost anointing, preaching the Word of God is invaluable. It is precious. It is life-giving. Master, today send forth your Word to heal. Help today, O oh God, the preacher to deliver the Word of God effectively, efficiently, 
in a manner, God, that is pleasing in your sight, in a manner that will bring forth fruit in the lives of the hearers. And help the hearers today, Lord, to receive this word. Let any misconceptions, any false teaching, any understandings that are contrary to the truth of your word, let them be dispelled, God, by reason of this word right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan, you're a liar and the father of lies. We bind you this hour upon the authority of Jesus' name. And we cast you forth as dumb. And we loose today the truth of God. For Jesus, our King, declares, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Grant it today, Lord, for we ask it all in none other than that saving name, Jesus, Yeshua the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul addresses the issue of grace. You will find that many of the references I will use in my message today will come from the book of Romans. It is not an accident this afternoon that the name that I was first given for my ministry as I embarked upon an LGBT affirming mission back in 1993, it is no accident that the name the Lord laid on my heart was Grace Oasis Ministries. Grace is the cornerstone of this ministry. And indeed, grace today is the cornerstone of the church of Jesus Christ as a whole. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Notice Paul said we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In Romans 5, 1 and 2, Paul is talking to the church at Rome. He is talking to believers. He's talking to Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name baptized saints of God. He said, by grace we have access. Through faith we have access. God has given us access. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to the unbeliever. And yet he ends this by saying that we now have a hope. And rejoice in hope. Of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means that even as born again children of God. Even as Jesus name baptized tongue talking Holy Ghost filled believers. That we still have not achieved the fullness of glorifying God. Hadn't got there yet. This is why in our primary text today, Paul writes in Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. Is he speaking of unbelievers? Is he speaking of those who are unregenerate? Those who are unsaved? No, he's speaking even of the believer. We all sin. We all fall, fall short of the glory of God. And this is why in Romans 5 he said that we stand in God's grace by faith. We have access to his grace. 
wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So you see, the glory of God is twice mentioned here. Oh, I want to tell you today, there's nobody in the Christian movement, there's nobody in the Christian church today, especially in evangelical and fundamentalist circles, as well as many others, who are not able to quote verbatim Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Sadly today, while grace is the foundation stone of the gospel, the truth is that the majority in the church today are entirely devoid of any true knowledge concerning the nature of and the work of God's grace. We sing songs about it. We talk about it. We use the language. We use the word grace. But most in the church haven't got a clue what grace is. By the end of this service and this message today, I hope you'll understand that grace is the great Compensation. What does that mean? That grace compensates for our weakness. That grace compensates for our failures. That grace compensates, yes, even for our sin. Hallelujah. No sin, nothing can inherit the, the kingdom of God that is sinful. Nothing can inherit the kingdom of God that is unclean. There will be no unclean thing on the highway of holiness. Hallelujah. But I'm here to tell you today that we remain in a state of sinfulness. We remain in a a state of ungodliness we remain in a state of filth and misery so long as we remain in this human body mm -hmm. but the gospel of Jesus Christ has done something for us the gospel of Jesus Christ has given us access to the kingdom of God it has allowed us to be our names to be penned in a book the book of life. And we talk about the book of life as though when we stand in the judgment, you know, God's going to look down and will your name be there? There's an old song that says, will my name be there? And that, you know, we picture the book of life being cracked open at the judgment. Oh, but honey, I've got news for you today. The book of life will have already been cracked open long before judgment. The book of life will be cracked open on resurrection morning as Jesus fills the eastern sky and the angels of God behind him and he is prepared to receive all of the saved, all of those who have believed on him and obeyed his gospel unto himself. The book of life will be open, Tommy. Why? Because only the names that appear in there have been guaranteed resurrection with the righteous. Only the names in that book have secured their ticket on the glory train. Hallelujah. Only the names in that book have been guaranteed a place in the rapture and in the resurrection of the righteous. Because they were righteous, because they were perfect, because grace somehow scrubbed them clean and caused them to become perfect and sinless and righteous? No. No. You see, if you believe that grace is an active ingredient that somehow performs a work in your life of sanctification and perfection, and perfecting, I should say, then you don't understand grace at all. Grace is not about 
perfecting. Grace is not about sanctifying. Grace is about justifying. And the justification according to the word of God occurs by grace. Listen to me, children. In the sight of God. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that by reason of God's grace, in response to our faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, God sees us as perfect. God sees us as holy. Oh, hallelujah. God sees us as sanctified. God sees us as righteous. Glory to God. And by reason of that grace, God places our name in the book of life, even though we are not yet all that we shall one day be. Whew. So grace does not clean you up. Grace does not perfect you. I got news for Pentecostal people, and boy, I'm going to set some high hair holiness folk off today. They're not going to be happy with what I'm about to say. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost does not perfect you either. It does not make you righteous either. It does not make you holy either. Jesus said to his disciples and to the church in the first chapter of the book of Acts, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And I've heard every kind of sermon under the sun preached on this passage. And I've heard more preachers, and God forgive me, I've done it myself. Define what the Lord meant by you shall receive power. What is that power for? What does that power do? And bless God, most Pentecostal preachers will get up and tell you, Oh, it's the power to live holy. It's the power to be godly. It's the power to do this and to do that. Um... No. It's the power to accomplish that one thing that is necessary to your salvation. Jesus said, He that believeth unto the end shall be saved. He didn't say, He that attaineth perfection. He that liveth holy, he that is righteous to the end. No, 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 no. He said, he that believeth to the end shall be saved. What then, if our faith is the thing that we must maintain to the very end in order to be saved, then what do you think the enemy is most after today in our lives? What do you think Satan most wants to attack? What do you think Satan w most wants to make the people of God abandon? Their faith. He wants them to no longer believe in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He wants them to no longer believe in the in the blood of the Lamb and in the power to wash away the sins of lost mankind. He wants us to no longer believe in the power of Jesus' name that is able to save our soul. He no longer wants us to believe in the indwelling and the infilling of the Holy Ghost as the promise of God for His people. So God fills us with His Spirit. Why? To make Himself real to us in a way that helps us to maintain our faith and to continue to walk daily 
in our faith and to face every trial and every tribulation and every temptation that might come our way with the intention of causing us to abandon or to compromise our faith in a living God. That power of the Holy Ghost helps us to face every attack of the enemy so that our faith remains intact. Oh, I may fail. I may fall. I may falter. I may say something I ought not to have said. I may do something I ought not to have done. There isn't a Holy Ghost filled Jesus name baptized believer in the world who hasn't done something stupid or said something sinful or done something wrong and ungodly and unrighteous since they've been filled with the Holy Ghost. There's not a one of us, if we'll be honest, who has not Feel God and fallen short of the glory of God since we've received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But in spite of that failure, in spite of that fall, our faith remained intact. Oh, hallelujah. When others might have been laid out flat, when others might have been knocked out, by that punch, the Holy Ghost filled believer does him or herself off, gets up, and keeps on plugging. Hallelujah <laughs> to God. Why? Because we've been endued with power from on high. Hallelujah. And that power is there to empower us to hold fast to our faith in spite of anything that might come against us. Grace is not an active ingredient. Grace is, in fact, a passive ingredient. Grace does not cleanse you. Grace does not purify you. Grace does not perfect you. Grace compensates. You'll look today at the illustration I have for my message, and you'll see a a young man standing there and in the background in the in the shadows is a large muscular figure you see within that young man there is something he cannot see that is stronger and more powerful than he is there is something in him that he cannot see that can do what he cannot do there is something within him that compensates for his weakness, that compensates for his failings, that compensates for his falling, that compensates for his sin. And that secret strong man in the background is the grace of God. Without the grace of God, all our faith would be worthless. Our faith today in the gospel, excuse me. Our faith today in the gospel would amount to little or nothing were it not for the grace of God. Grace means unearned, unmerited, undeserved. You've not done anything to earn it. You've not done anything to deserve it. Favor. God responds to our faith with unearned, unmerited favor. He responds to our faith, not to our actions. He responds to our faith with Grace, hallelujah. It is therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God. 
I'm going to tell you something today. If you have believed this gospel and obeyed this gospel and you still are struggling and you still go to bed at night with all kinds of doubts and all kinds of condemnation, then you haven't understood this thing right. You haven't gotten this thing right. No, we now have peace with God. Because we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also, by who? Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace. So it is faith that allows us to then access God's grace. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's not about works. It's not about actions. It's not about what you do or don't do or how you do it or how you don't do it. It's about what you believe. Now, I do not want, and I want to make this statement early in the message today. I don't want anybody to run out and say, Oh, Pastor Charles said you can live like a dog and be the biggest sinner in town. And God's grace will cover you that there's no requirement in the book, in the word of God for a, a child of God to live right and to act right. Now, that's not at all what I'm saying. The word of God said, what shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid. You do not live like a sinner simply because grace exists and grace is there. No, it doesn't work that way. But I don't live right. I don't try to do right. I don't try to act right. I don't try to live up to uh, God's standard for his people because I'm trying to make heaven. I do that so that I can be a servant of God. Listen to me, children. Who is profitable? You see, what good are you doing to the kingdom of God? What good are you doing for the kingdom of God if you're out there living like a dog, whoring it up, drinking it up, drugging it up, doing all the things the world does, doing things the way the world does them? How are you benefiting the kingdom of God? Don't you know that the first principle for believers is that we are to do what? Seek ye first, first, first the kingdom of God. What? And his righteousness. Why? And all these things shall be added unto you. If you want the best life as a child of God, then you know that the best life comes by doing things God's way. Right. Now, we don't live a sinful, ungodly life just because the grace of God is there. We don't earn our way into heaven either by reason of our works and actions. But that doesn't mean that these two things do not coexist. The grace of God and our doing right and acting right. No, they coexist. But they coexist because as a child of God, part of believing God, part of believing on the word of God and believing the gospel is knowing then that God's way is the best way. Jesus Christ said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. If you want the best life you can have, honey, then the best thing in the world you can do is do things God's way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And if along your journey things fall short, if along your journey there's something in your life that in fact displeases God, or if there's something in your life that doesn't quite match up and doesn't quite add up, don't worry about it. God's grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. God's grace is the great compensator. God's grace compensates for our weakness, for our failures, for our faults, and for our sins. 1 John 3, 1 through 3, the Word of God declares, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Notice, it knew him not. Knew, past tense, him not. Who did it not know? Who is the uh, subject of this sentence? The Father. So it says, it didn't know the Father. It knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So we're now the sons of God, and yet it doesn't yet appear what we're going to one day be. But we know, hallelujah, we know when he shall appear. Who is the subject of this sentence? The Father, hallelujah. When he shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man hath hope, hath this hope in him, excuse me, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. You can't be in love with Jesus without wanting to be like Jesus. You cannot live for God without wanting to do those things that please the Lord. I've been in a relationship with Tommy now for over 19 years. i got news for you. I do things all the time with the express intent and purpose of making Tommy happy. Doesn't have a thing in the world to do with me. Doesn't have a thing in the world to do with what I want to do. Doesn't have a thing in the world to do with what I want to spend my money on. Doesn't have a thing in the world to do with how I want to spend my day. Hello now. No. You can't love somebody. You can't care about somebody. You can't be in a relationship with somebody without wanting to please them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Well, the same is true of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't possibly be in relationship with Him and still be out in the world living like a dog. No, because that is not what pleases Him. Hello now. That is not what brings Him joy and makes Him happy. So therefore, if we're in love with the Lord, if we're in relationship with the Lord, then we want to do those things that please Him. Therefore... Every man that hath this, what? Hope. Hope of what? Romans 5, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. One day we will be glorified. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, And lest I should be exalted above measure, Paul writes, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Buffet literally means to continually pound. It's like a beating, to beat me. Lest I should be exalted above measure, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he, the Lord, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then Am I strong? Grace is the great compensation. Grace 
compensates. Hallelujah. Paul asked God to remove this thing from him that he identified as sinful. He thought of it as demonic. Sent from Satan. But he said, but there was given unto me. Here's something in, in his life that he looked upon as being demonic and evil, and yet he never said, the enemy attacked me, the enemy. He said, no, this was given unto me. In other words, what have I talked about? How many times have you heard me talk about believers always blaming the devil, always blaming the devil? Paul saying, no, God gave this to me. God allowed this in my life. Oh my goodness, white gay person, do you know today, God allowed you to be gay. God allowed you to be who you are. Hello now. Why? So that you could go to hell in a handbasket because he hates you and he despises you? No, so that you would learn to rely upon his grace. Hallelujah. That you would do the best you could with what you got and that you would believe him and trust in his gospel and put your faith in his grace. And grace will be for you as it is for any believer. The great compensation. It will compensate for your sin. It will compensate for your weakness. It will compensate for your failure. So you see, this is why I don't argue with people who want to argue with me about whether homosexuality is sin or whether it's this or whether it's that. I say, folks, you know what? If you understood grace, it wouldn't matter. Your, your, your argument is a mute point. You can identify, I don't agree with their way of looking at it, but you know what, if you want to believe that, fine. I could care less because in the end, if you understand the grace of God correctly, then you'll understand that I am standing on holy ground. Hallelujah to God. I am standing on a firm foundation. Praise the name of the Lord. Because I'm trusting in God's grace. I'm believing in God's will. I'm just tearing stuff up today, aren't I? I'm believing in God's divine favor. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's continue this afternoon. Almost done, I think. Amen. Grace is not a means whereby we are perfected or made holy. Grace is the means whereby we have access to the hope and the promise of one day being perfected. The church has contorted the message of grace and made it as much begotten to works as was the law of Moses. But the word of God declares what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. What the law could not do in securing one standing before God, that is justification, grace can do. God's gospel of grace is not a message of sinless perfection, which follows one's conversion, but rather one's hope of sinless perfection being secured through faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That faith is the ingredient which then activates God's grace or his unmerited favor on our behalf. Grace does not help us do anything. Grace does on our behalf. It does not help us do anything. It does on our behalf what we are incapable of doing. We believe unto righteousness. We do not work unto righteousness. Because of God's grace, our faith is sufficient, and he then views us as justified. Hallelujah. Romans 5, 12 through 17. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, 
And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Did you hear me? The gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. A gift is given. It is not earned. Right. If it is earned, it is not gift. It is a payment. Right. He said, the, uh, And the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is not our righteousness, but His. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life, by Jesus Christ our Lord. There is only one that God expects to be perfect. There is only one that God expects to be holy. There is only one that God expects to be genuinely righteous, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is by the righteousness of one that many, will be saved. Hallelujah. So therefore, it is not our righteousness that earns a place in heaven. It is His righteousness. How do we access that righteousness? How do we stand before God justified? It's very easy. We do so by faith. We believe and obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In doing that, we are allowed access to the grace of God. We are allowed access to God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. Oh, hallelujah. Our name goes in the book of life, and we are slated to participate in the resurrection of the righteous. Hallelujah. Romans 11 and 6, the word of God declares, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What is Paul saying? In a nutshell, you can't have it both ways. 
It either has to be by reason of your actions and your deeds and your conduct that you attain righteousness, or it is by grace. It cannot be both ways. Because the minute you begin to try to earn heaven, you put yourself under the law. You put yourself in a position where the law is over you, and you abandon altogether the concept of grace. Why? Because grace is not active, it is passive. Hallelujah. Grace is based on our ability to obey, to believe and obey the gospel, thus accessing that grace. But if you're not simply believing and obeying the gospel and you're putting your confidence in works and doing all the right things according to some uh, edict or some law or some set of rules or standards, then obviously you're not working within the realms of grace because grace relies entirely upon faith. My goodness, have mercy. In Romans chapter 4, verses... Two through five, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt? If you work, then that means God owes you salvation, because after all, you put in the work. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, who, does, who is justified to them that believe on him, the ungodly, the ungodly, that justifieth the ungodly. Now listen, comma, his faith is counted for righteousness. Whose faith is counted for righteousness? The ungodly. The ungodly who have done what? Who have believed on him. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through Five. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Listen to verse 4, Galatians 5. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law. Listen. Karma, ye are fallen from grace. Every time somebody comes to you and they've got some little law, some little rule in the Word of God, and they let you know you can't possibly make heaven because you do this or because this is in your life or because, and they come at you with it, and it's, oh, no, the law said thus and so. Honey, I've got news for you. The minute you feel that you are obligated to honor one point of the law, you become obligated to honor the entire law. Mm -hmm. And Christ is no longer of any effect for you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because at that point, you have abandoned faith, and it is faith that accesses grace. Hello now. Oh my goodness. He said, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Verse 5, Galatians 5. For we through the Spirit wait, listen, for the hope of righteousness by faith. Doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
Now are we called the sons of God. Every time we call ourselves a son of God, every time we say, I'm saved, every time we say, I'm sanctified, Every time we say, I stand among the righteous, we are making a declaration by faith. We are not making a declaration of fact. That's right, yeah. Every time you say, I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm saved and I know that I am. You are making a declaration of faith. You haven't yet been saved. You won't be fully saved until redemption is complete. If I go to the dog pound, if I go to the uh, local facility that cares for animals that need to be adopted, and I go in, and I find an animal that I love, and I say, I want that dog, I'm going to take that dog home, I'm going to rescue that dog. That dog is due to go in and be euthanized because it's been here now for a certain length of time, but I'm going to rescue that dog. And I sign off, and I pay the fee that needs to be paid to adopt that dog, and I tell the person now listen I'm going to come back for that dog that dog is mine I'm saving that dog from being destroyed and that person says to me yes sir that's fine but we must have you take him by such and such an hour on such and such a day and I say okay I'll be back now I've paid for it I've signed for it Everything that needs to be done has been done. Has that dog yet been saved? Can I now go out and say to people, Oh, I saved the dog from being destroyed. I saved the dog from being put down and euthanized at the pound today. No, I cannot. Not until I have redeemed the dog. Not until I have gone and completed the entire contract and completed the entire uh, uh, excuse me. I said arrangement. Arrangement, amen. <laughs> Not until I've done everything. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? And this is what people don't understand about salvation. Salvation in this life is about faith. Faith accesses God's grace. But our salvation will not be complete. The Word of God said the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a down payment on our redemption. It's a down payment. It's like going to the car dealer and saying, I want that car, I like that car, I want that color, I want those features, I want that exact model. And you get a contract and they put on that contract the vehicle identification number for that specific car. That is the car you want. And you make a down payment. Now you've secured that car for yourself. But is that car yours? No. You haven't paid for it yet. You haven't finished securing the finances. You haven't driven off the lot. You can go out and tell people, I bought a new car, I bought a new car, I bought a new car. But if the bank won't finance you, have you bought a new car? No. You haven't bought nothing. You just signed a contract saying you wanted to buy a car. But until that vehicle has been picked up and redeemed, as it were, then it has not been purchased. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? We have the earnest money, the earnest of the Holy Ghost in our lives today. And at the redemption of the church, at the rapture of the church, at the uh, resurrection of the righteous, God is going to redeem, the word of the Lord said, his purchased possession. That's when he's going to take his purchased possession. And at that moment, you will be fully, completely, undoubtedly, eternally saved. Hallelujah. And the devil will never be able to reverse nothing. He will never be able to turn that thing around. He will never be able to lay his hands on your soul. Hallelujah. Because you will have been fully saved saved. But until then, we've got to maintain our faith. Because it's our faith that accesses God's grace, His favor, 
And it is that grace that is the great compensation. It compensates for anything in our life that is lacking. Anything in our life that would cause us to stand before God as unpure, unholy, ungodly, unrighteous. It is that grace that compensates and causes God to look upon us and to see us today as what we are not yet today, but rather what we will be tomorrow. And how can God be so sure of that? Well, it's simple, because He is not basing His confidence on our ability to do anything. He is basing His confidence on His Word, on His promise. And the Word of God declares, the promises of God are yea and amen by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Grace today is the great compensation. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.